Good morning or good evening. Wherever you are and whoever you are, those of us gathered here in the sanctuary and all of those of you who are worshiping with us virtually. This, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, I thank you for being here today. So much is going on in the world. But this is still the Lord's day. One time, not in my life since I was born into the world that we have need. This day, 2023, we have need need of the Lord. What the world needs now is the Lord God Almighty. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We see you, Lord. We hear you. Help us. Come with us today on this Father's Day to the book of Genesis. First book of the Bible means the beginning. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. And if you're able, won't you stand out of respect and reverence for God's holy word. And listen now for the word of the Lord. After these things, God tested, God tested Abraham. And he said, here I am. God said, take your son your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young man, he said, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and we will worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, he said, Father, and his father said, here I am, my son. He said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together, and when they came to the place that God had shown them, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He, he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and then Abraham reached out his hand, and he took the knife to kill his son. But but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am, he said. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know, now I know that you fear God. And since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, and Abraham looked up, and he saw a ram caught in a thicket by its thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place 
the Lord will provide. Ah, oh, and as it is said to this day, on that mount of the Lord, it shall, the Lord shall be a provider. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And now won't you pray with and for me. Almighty God, as I come before the world and before your people called out, set apart as a woman of God. Lord, I ask that you would allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, thy sight, O oh Lord. For not them, but you. You are my strength. And you are my redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray and I give thanks, I honor, love, and cherish you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let the church say with me, amen. Put a smile on your face, everybody. Put a smile on your face. And repeat after me. The Lord, the Lord will, will provide. provide. Oh, glory to God. The Lord will provide. My dearly beloved, you know, sometimes God tells us to do things that we do not want to do. That's the major problem in the church today. God telling the church to do what the people do not want to do. But what many of us fall, fall, fail to realize is that the thing God instructs us to do will be the very thing that leads us to the greatest blessing. But if only we would obey and do what God tells us to do. Can the church say amen? Well, on this Father's Day, we want to investigate the life of a man named Abraham. The Bible informs us that one day God decided that he would continue to test Abraham's faith. To test his faith. God had already done things for Abraham that were beyond his imagination, don't you remember, when he didn't have any children, and God worked a miracle when he at 100 and Sarah at 80 had a baby. Because God had told him so, he's going to continue to test Abraham. That wasn't enough. God will continue to test our faith. God had already told him to leave his family and his country in Canaan, travel to a strange, unfamiliar place that the Lord would show him. You see, you see, God intended to use Abraham as the instrument through which, through which he would bless all the nations of, of the earth. But before God could use Abraham in any way, Abraham first had to be Test it. Look at somebody and say, prepare for your test. Now listen, beloved. God did not test Abraham because he was unsure of Abraham's faithfulness and reliability. Nobody knew Abraham better than God knew Abraham. God tested Abraham so that Abraham would learn to totally trust in the power of Almighty God. And so here's the test. 
here's the test. You want to hear the test? This is a real test right here. The Bible says in verse Verses 1 and 2, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. Abraham answered, here I am. And God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering as one of the mountains that I shall show you. In other words, in other words, God was telling Abraham to kill his only son as a sacrifice to him. You're talking about a test. That's, that's, a, that's a test. Oh, beloved, that's enough to make you gasp for breath. How could God do and ask? Such a thing. Well, what we know is this. In this situation, God was not being harsh or cruel. He was doing what was necessary to deepen Abraham's faith in God. God knows that without faith in him, we cannot live a victorious life. Without faith in God, we cannot live be a Christian. So God knew that until our faith is challenged and exercised, our faith will not be strong enough to live a triumphant life because we need great faith in God to be able to conquer anything. You got to have faith in God. Therefore, sometimes God requires us to take the dearest and the most precious thing that we own or think we own, help me up in here somebody, and place it in God's hands. Not so that God might take it away from us, but so that we might learn to trust God with everything that we have now today. God is testing his church and those in it for two reasons. One, they profess ownership of something that doesn't belong to them, which is God's church. And two, because they love the church more than they love God. God is testing the church. Today. So, so, when, when Abraham received this word from God, he set out to do as he was instructed to do, not by people, but by God. And you talk about a pastor getting into trouble. It's when we don't do what the people say do. But the real trouble it's when we do say what the people said do and not do what God said do. Somebody say amen. I know it's the truth. Beloved, even at the darkest moment of his life, Abraham was willing to trust and obey the Lord. We don't, we, we, we don't really trust the Lord. We don't really trust the Lord until we can trust him during the darkest moments of our life. And this is indeed what Abraham did. Ah, oh, I could just hear him thinking out loud and, and talking to himself. You know, we grew up where if you had something to say to your parents' authority, see right now people don't want to trust the greatest authority who is God, but, but we had a training growing up. If you were upset about something, your mama or your daddy said, you better not say it out loud. You better say it to yourself. I, I can hear Abraham respecting God. Abraham, Abraham said, oh, Lord, I can't, I can't believe what you're asking me to do. That's what he said to himself. Lord, I don't understand this assignment. It, it makes no sense to me. But I will give you. 
my son. But Lord, why my son? Why, why my son? Lord, why not me? Why not me? I give you my life in place of my son's life. Oh, Lord, this is certainly the most difficult thing you've ever asked me to do. Child of God. Child of God, it seems to be more impressive today when we say, I did it my way. <laughs> then when we say, I did what God told me to do. That's become my model of my life. I've done what God told me to do against all odds from every corner. I've done what God told me to do. Because today it just seems that we are more determined to do things our way than to do things God's way. And that's the sad truth. Listen, one sure thing being obedient to God has taught me is this. It's not about me. It's not about my family. Certainly not about lay people. It's about God, not about me, not about you. It's about God. Huh. One of the things that happened just recently, if you understand the Southern Baptist Convention just voted for women not to be pastors. And the church they attacked most was Saddleback Church, one of the largest churches in the country here in California, who has over 200 mega churches. And I'm not impressed with anything but a mega church. I feel like a failure if I don't have one because that's what God said, go make disciples. That's clear about it. So Rick Warren, who is one of the greatest pastors I've ever known, wrote his book, wrote book, all kind of books. One of the best one is The Purpose Driven Life. And what he says in the very beginning, that is the one thing that we have to learn is, it's not about us. It's all about God. And so Pastor Rick Warren, who said the Lord told him not allowing women to be pastors was a sin, broke the rules. 2021 ordained three women. And last week, they kicked him out of the convention. But this is my thing. This is my thing. All them people that kicked Rick Warren and his church out and another woman who had pastored the church for a long time kicked her out. I bet nobody up in there had had a church as big as Saddleback. It's the little people always trying to tell you what to do. It's the little people who won't stand up for the truth of God. Rick Warren has retired. He's not even well. And he stood there with a crutch and said, God calls women to preach. And he said, well, we put you out. And this is my question. Does he care? Does, does he care? The largest United Methodist church in the country is a black church in Houston, Windsor Village. They never admitted it. And yet the devil attacked Windsor Village by attacking the pastor. Let me tell you something. The devil don't go after little bitty churches because that ain't no cool. Uh, like the, the devil don't go after people who sin. That ain't no cool. The devil goes after the church with the most people who will be attacked by his ways, by his ways. God is watching the world turn on the churches that have made a major difference in this country. And all I pray is that they stand fast to the word of God, no matter what 
people say, no matter what the denomination says, no matter what, stand fast to the word of God. There are 10,000 African Americans in the whole jurisdiction here in California. There were more than 10,000 members at Windsor Village in one church. That's who the devil I know people in the little churches want to act like the devil, but that's fine. Go on. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> because as Christians, we cannot deny that serving the Lord is, is sometimes a difficult and draining task. Sometimes the road gets rough and the battle so hard to fight that our strength begins to run out. Sometimes when we are trying to hold on, our heart becomes filled with fear and doubt because we just don't see how we are going to make it. I've been there. Believe me, I've been there. It's just Statistics have just come out of this denomination, the United Methodist Church, that black women have been treated worse than anybody in the clergy family. The facts are there. Oh, we have to remember the songwriter. The songwriter says, through it all. See, you got to, you got to, through it all, what I've learned. No, can't nobody tell me nothing about God. I've learned to depend on Jesus. I've learned to depend on God's word. Because when I needed somebody, people weren't there. God was always there. Whenever I've been obedient to the will of God and not my own will, I have been blessed. I said this story before, but God will always test you <laughs> when you think you up. God will always test you by asking you to do something that will be difficult for you to do. God will always test you by asking you to give up something that you just obsessed with. One of the best jobs I ever had, and I've mentioned this before, was in television. Oh, it's so sad to see people in the corporate world more kind and compassionate than the church. I love being in television. Oh, and they watched everything that I did. They just blessed me in television. I was struggling, struggling, struggling financially and physically, emotionally, taking care of my daddy and two kids all by myself. I was struggling. I was struggling. My salary was $18,000 a year when I started in television. A new president came and he, he called me out. The new boss came and called me out. And with, after a few years, I was making four to five times what I started making. That's when I bought my Cadillac and everything. I was making money for the first time in my adult life in an atmosphere of compassion. When my car broke down, when I didn't have nothing, they'd say, just check out one of the TV cars. Lydia, just check it out. Keep it for as long as you need. One of the workers there said, I had no idea you made such little money and worked so hard. Listen, listen, if you ever need something, I got some money. Just ask me. And... Right after I went and bought this Cadillac on my own credit, I didn't need no husband to sign or nothing. I had it going on. I had it going on. 
God said to me, Lydia, don't forget the call on your life. Don't get so caught up in television that you forget the call on your life. It's time for you to go to seminary. And to myself, like Abraham, to myself, God, <laughs> God, why did you insist on this when I was broke? You know what I mean, God? You know what I mean, God? I mean, God, come on. Come on, God. That's the first time I bought new furniture for my kids and bought new clothes. God, it's time for you to go to seminary. I said, but, but, he said, your father is here with me now. You don't have the excuse you used to tell me, but God, I can't go to seminary because I got to take care of my daddy. Okay, he's with me. Your mama with me. You got two children. You're going to leave television and the money and all the kindness. And you're going to go to seminary. I lost Everything material. Would you add so-and-so? That ain't the preacher. That's another lay person. Lay people talking to lay people. Talk to young people today and say, who you hear that from? My friend. Your friend 14 and you 14. <laughs> there is an authority. You see, disobedience is the greatest sin. Yeah, it's the greatest sin. Because disobedience is an insult to God's authority and God's power. And God won't be disgraced. <laughs> Think about it because the truth is this. When we obey God, God will. My greatest wish. See, a preacher should never preach without his own personal or her own personal testimony. My greatest wish is one day to hear God say, See, I've been hurt by enough people that you know I know I know I know the deal. God say, I want to hear God say. Good and faithful servant. Against all odds, you stood your ground in my word. You stood my ground when I spoke to you. It amazes me that you go to a church and everybody, anything, God told them something. That's confusion. When any pastor comes, when your new pastor comes, the first question you should ask is, Pastor, what is the vision God has given you? for this church and then you put the feet on the vision because a pastor gets real confused when everybody had got a vision I've heard people come to me and say pastor the Lord told me to tell you oh God's talking behind my back now he hired me I report to him but he talking to you that ain't the way God fixed this up God fixed this up. You better respect the pastor. You better look for the vision the pastor comes with. And if you don't come with no vision, or she does not come with a vision from God, then, Houston, we got a problem. My dearly beloved, we all in our hearts ought to have a song. Because I've had to fight my way. I've had to struggle. I've had to go against evil things and evil. Through it all, I've learned. In 
And so now, God not through with me yet. But right now, I desire to have a faith that sees the invisible A faith that expects the incredible. He's testing me now. A faith in God. That can conquer. God that uproots my problems. Faith to know that God can solve them. Faith to vision my freedom. Have a faith. I'm telling you, if some of you knew the true story of the condition that African American women pastors have today in this church, we have to have a faith in God that can conquer anything. Faith to reach the unreachable. Faith, the unbeatable. Faith, to remove the unmovable. Faith, faith, faith that withstands the invincible. Oh, Lord, help me. I have a faith. Increase my faith, Lord, and you increase it. Lord, give me a faith in you that will conquer anything and anybody in Jesus' name. I have the faith to see expects the impossible receive the incredible or oh, faith that can conquer anything faith that uproots my problem faith to know God can solve them faith to vision my freedom oh, and faith that will Unreachable faith to fight the unbeatable faith to move the unmovable faith to stand the invincible faith that can conquer anything. Unreachable faith to fight the 
God is speaking so loudly now. To his people, especially. You know, it was the church people who crucified Jesus. That's why he called them hypocrites. All the other stuff Jesus called. to pretend they know him. We need a faith today. Not in myself. Not in you. But in God. Because I've learned that the Lord will provide my every According to his riches in glory. I was so upset the other day. My son reminded me, said, Mama, 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 Mama. They be quoting the Bible to me now. It's interesting. Ah. He said, Mama, your enemies will become your footstool. He said, Mama, 
the Bible says, touch not my anointed, do my prophet no harm. Don't worry about it. I said, thank you, son. I'm reminded that God's going to invite my enemies to my party. I'm going to have a big party. can't complain. Jesus gave his life. I can't complain. Not my will, Lord. But your will I'll fight for until you bring me home. Your will be done. And for those of you who want to give, we ask that you would uh, leave your offering today with Sister Carmen. Just leave your offering today. She'll put it in office. For those of you who are watching who would like to send an offering. This is God's day and God's time. You better be careful. Join the church of God. Become a member. Get your ticket to heaven. Church say.